Hi everybody, I uh, hope you're having a great time with the ALKA Wildlife Conference in the Czech Republic. Unfortunately, I couldn't be with, there with you. Um, well, I suppose it's not too unfortunate. I'm in a great place myself. Here I am in the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador. This is where I live and where I've spent a number of years working on wildlife conservation projects in human landscapes. And I'm looking forward to giving you a presentation on that subject. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. I hope you're all well and hopefully we will meet each other one day in another conference somewhere once uh, all these restrictions are finished. So you all take care and um, yeah, enjoy the presentation. Okay, so let's get started on my presentation on strategies for mitigating human bear conflict in the Ecuadorian Andes. First of all, I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is David Jackson. I'm a British biologist who's lived in Ecuador for 19 years now, working with Andean bears, with mountain tapirs, with a number of different species in the Amazon region in conservation efforts, which include rescue, rehabilitation, and reintroduction to the wild of species, and also research initiatives as well. So, um, you know, the experience I've got, I'm gonna share with you in this presentation today. Uh, let's begin with talking about why conflicts have arisen between human beings and wildlife. Um, of course, for millennia, human beings and wildlife have lived in harmony um, as one part of nature. And over the last few centuries, that's kind of changed where uh, human beings have kind of separated from nature and almost believe that they're superior. And this has led to a number of different conflict situations and a number of different issues that we're seeing today as far as conservation efforts are concerned and we're going to talk about how we've mitigated those efforts in the Ecuadorian Andes and in, and in the Amazon uh, using strategies that we've found successful and hopefully they can be helpful for your projects wherever you are in the world. I think it's vital for us as human beings to understand that we were, are and always will be part of nature and part of the natural tapestry that makes up planet earth and once we can do that, we can start to look at ways where we can improve things for ourselves and for nature at the same time, because a healthy natural environment is necessary for the humans to survive and also for nature to survive. It's really important that us as humans do our part and try and do our bit to give something back to Mother Nature and, and do our bit to conserve the natural environment, which almost depends on us at the moment because of the ways that we've negatively impacted it over the past few centuries, as I mentioned. So let's talk about the major conservation issues we face here in Latin America. As with the rest of the world, conservation efforts are focused upon a number of man-made impacts due to the increase in population, which has led to an increase in demand for materials and resources and space, which have had knock-on effects on a number of wild populations through habitat destruction and fragmentation, where habitat's been um, chopped down or destroyed and that's led to the isolation of populations which also in turn leads to a, a weakening of the gene pool and therefore it's really putting at risk the longevity of the spe of, of species. Also encroachment which is also down to habitat destruction where the human, the ironically named human domain is becoming closer to wild populations and leading to a number of human conflicts. In turn, that leads to more hunting and poaching. There are resource extraction initiatives by mining companies and petrol companies throughout the world. Agricultural practices are becoming more and more reliant on chemical pesticides and pollution is a result of that and a number of other human activities. And of course, everything leads to climate change. There's one common denominator with all these factors. It's all caused by us and we're the only ones that can change that. So how can we have the greatest conservation impact? I think to have the biggest impact, we need to target vitally important areas of ecological significance and that are under the biggest threat. And these areas are critical habitats for endemic and endangered and vulnerable species, obviously places where these species exist, biodiversity hotspots, um, maybe as you saw in the previous maps, there's a number of areas that are clusters biodiversity hotspots, like in this area, for example, the Choco bioregion or the tropical Andes, which are two crucial biodiversity hotspots that have um, a wealth of species, a wealth of diversity, and they really are endangered. So it's vital to protect them. 
unique and rare habitats such as the Prailejon Paramos. The Paramo ecosystem is, is unique and it's only found between northern Peru and the south of Panama, so it's vital to, to protect that. And augmented habitats, ones that have been um, fragmented and forest patches are separated from each other due to our impact in deforestation. And the marine environment, one of the environments that is the most important to protect, but it's the most forgotten of all because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, as I guess, so to speak. However, despite being out of our sight, it's so important to protect the marine environment. It's got such an impact on terrestrial ecosystems, on ourselves, on everything, that the marine environment is one of the most important that we need to protect. It's also crucially important to protect areas on a regional level, uh, areas that are vitally important for certain species life history events, for example, nesting sites and breeding sites. Uh, with our studies here, we've noticed that a lot of nesting sites where Andean bear mothers are um, looking after their young in the maternal nest, <clears throat> it's getting so close even to within a few hundred meters of human settlements and human populations, basically, basically because um, these areas are really, really sought after and they're very specific to the needs of the mother in the sense of shelter from the wind, from the rain, that they have to look after and protect their young in areas that are so close to human populations. Um, again, we'll talk about wild, uh, wildlife corridors and habitat fragmentation. When the forest patches are cut off from each other, um, individuals from a species cannot interact with each other, they can't mate, and this is again causing problems with the genetic makeup of the, of the populations, and it's vital to protect the wildlife corridors, and if not protect them, to regenerate them and reforest them. Um, isolated patches of habitat abundant in foodstuffs are really important. There's a lot of places where, for example, there's a lot of, a lot of trees that have certain fructification cycles where they're really important to a species' um, longevity and a species and a population's um, proliferation. So it's so important to protect those areas too. Again, in arid environments, waterholes are really important to protect. Um, oasis is places where there's some forest cover in the middle of deserts and salt licks, which are really important as well to, to species. Also on a species level, I think it's really important to consider our conservation efforts in human landscapes. Um, critically endangered, endangered and perhaps vulnerable species, I think, should be focused on first, um, the ones that are most in need, of course, um, you know, whether they be large mammals, whether they be small insects, um, it's all the same, but it's really important to, first of all, study and then try and protect the critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable species, and maybe even the ones that haven't been discovered yet, of course. And also keystone and umbrella species, um, for example, the Andean bear is, we like to call it the gardener of the cloud forest ecosystem here in Ecuador. Um, basically because he has a number of behaviours that um, promote the regeneration of the cloud forest and also maintain the dynamic of the cloud forest at the same time, whereas in the sense that they will open up clearings through their climbing behaviour, which en enables the undergrowth to come through. Also, they prune back um, tank bromeliads, which is vital for the hydrological cycle. So species that have a, a great effect and due to their protection, you're protecting a number of other species. I believe it's important to protect those species in particular. So let's move on to factors influencing conflict and I'll focus specifically on our study area here where you know obviously it might be different to other people's but I'm sure there's certain things that ring true in many many ecosystems many study areas too. So something that influences the conflict is the proximity of crops or pastures to wild habitat. For example uh, here the the local people um, are unable to plant the crops right next to the house, which also is to do with the distance of crops and pastures from settlement, which is the second point there. Um, they have to, um, due to the land use here, um, often plant their crops and have their livestock right next to wild habitat and far away from the houses. Often people here um, have their livestock eight hours walk away from from where they live so they've got to go maybe once every week every two weeks even and during that time a bear or a puma or a jaguar or any other um, predator could have eaten a calf could have eaten a, a live a full-grown cow and this is causing huge problems where um, it's really affecting the harmony that should exist between humans and nature 
um, the agricultural and sustenance practice of local populations, um, obviously dependent upon what people decide to grow, what people decide to have as a means of income. And this is something that is always difficult, for example, where people will tie their cows up to better use their um, pastures, which is perhaps not the best way, but it's the way that people know. And because the cows are tied up, of course, it's like they're like sitting ducks, pardon uh, the pun, and they um, are easy easy prey for the for the bears or for the jaguars or for the pumas as well in in this environment, of course. Um, the movement and diet of wild populations obviously depends upon the diet of the population, whether there's going to be a conflict or not, and how they move, how they move between forest patches. We'll talk about the corridors again. When they disappear, they're more likely to pass through pasture land, which is going to cause heightened um, levels of impact of conflict. And cultural tr traditions. Um, often people go up not just because they want to clear land, not just because they um, are wanting to put cows in an area, they will Traditionally, because it's been done through generations, they will go and burn the paramo ecosystem up in the high grasslands, and this is causing a massive impact as well on wild populations of a number of species, not just obviously the larger species. It's it's having a whole effect on the on the entire food chain. So I'm just going to talk about um, one part of our project, which is the reintroduction programs or reinsertion programs of Andean bears back into the wild. Uh, basically, we work with the Ecuadorian Ministry of Environment and the Environmental Police to rescue bears that have been in very deprived conditions. You can see the bear cub in the top left corner here. Uh, we rescued her. She was tied up, chained up, um, stood up. She couldn't even lay down, um, sleeping in her own excrement. And um, basically, we rescued her. Uh, you can see our veter veterinarian wildlife vet, Leonardo there, Dr. Leo. And um, he's checking the the teeth of the bear. You know, you, they, they go through a whole um, health screening process, and then there's a decision process made to see whether they can go on to a rehabilitation program or not, whether they can be re reinserted back into the wild. Obviously, that depends on, on a number of factors. The same bear you can see in the top left corner. You can see here in the bottom right corner, and she is not just um, successfully released back into the wild. She's also um, had a cub, she's an offspring in the wild, which is a real success story from taking a bear from such conditions throughout the whole rehabilitation process. You can see a helicopter here sometimes where possible, we will um, take them to the release sites in helicopters, but unfortunately it's not always possible. So occasionally down at the bottom here, you can see we have to carry them on our backs as well at times, which is not easy, but um, sometimes necessary. Um, and there we are, that's the rehabilitation and reintroduction side of our project. One of the real success stories, I believe, to our reintroduction programs um, to minimize and to um, to evade conflict is to select a suitable release site. The, the release site is so important. It's some, something that um, perhaps a lot of projects don't consider, but it's really important, especially in human landscapes where, um, you know, if you release a bear or animal too close to a human population, you're almost certainly going to get problems because they've had imprinting throughout the rehabilitation process as, as much as you want to minimize the contact that you have with those animals there's always going to be something that will kind of attract them to human populations and cause conflicts so um, through our uh, research program which is another part of our study which is on the next slide um, we have found out a number of information on wild bear ecology which has really really helped our um, reintroduction programs Apologies, I got cut off there. My battery ran out and I had to go and charge my computer. So, um, as I was saying, um, conflict situations really can only be mitigated in reintrodu reintroduction programs and with any other conflict mitigation process um, when projects are complemented with a research initiative where, where we learn about the bear's ecology, where we learn about various different species ecology to enable us to better manage, better handle those species and the conflicts that they have in human landscapes. And we're going to talk about the research side of things. So obviously with the research of wild animals, uh, you can find a number of information out. Uh, what we've done with the bears is we've captured bears, put radio or GPS collars on them to track them with telemetry equipment. And we've begun to put together home ranges, core areas, movement patterns, 
habitat use and a number of different information that is so important to mitigating conflicts and to you know pr preserving that um, harmony that exists or should exist between humans and nature so you can see in the top left here um, there's a uh, Eight diff nine different bears home ranges on the top right we've got mountain tapirs that we've colored and we've got the um, home ranges for those and also the movement patterns and habitat uses also um, you can see down near the bottom left here you can see some arrows on the chart which are wildlife corridors that we've identified through our research which is really important um, again with the conflict conflict mitigation um, activity patterns down, down on the bottom right here uh, which kind of gives us an idea when the bears are most active, when they're not active, and just a few pictures of of me, I guess, and Armando, my colleague, um, collaring bears, um, taking blood samples when we've uh, captured a bear, listening for them with the radios, and and so on. So research initiatives are so important. It's a crucial part of any conflict mitigation um procedure in in any environment i believe whatever species you're working with obviously you can't radio color every, every every species dependent upon size but um to protect natural environment it's really important to research the native populations okay so um we're going to quickly talk about the conflict mitigation I, I believe there's a number of ways we can do that um and one of those is incidence mapping. Basically, when you're finding out the areas, obviously, that are agricultural areas, which are going to be at high risk for farmers to put their crops, put their livestock. And you can see a chart to the top right here. Um, the red areas are generally the areas that are going to be of major concern if anybody does put any, any livestock or any crops there, that there may be a problem. So we advise against that. And um, obviously, you can't just advise people not to do something. You've got to try and give alternatives. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But... Um, it's really important to be able to advise where and where not it's advisable to um, put their crops and livestock. Um, compensation programs, um, we'll, we'll talk in detail about all these in a minute. Deterrence, um, like dogs, fireworks and things like that. Non-destructive alternative practices, provide community support as a mitigation tool, environmental education, awareness initiatives. And also it's really important with the information you get from the research is to lobby for legislation change and government support to any project that you've got. Okay, we'll talk about incidence mapping really quickly. Um, so you can see the charts here. Um, you know, you start to get an idea of where the bears are moving, each individual bear and also generally as a population, which areas they generally they spend more time in, probably due to the fructification cycles of certain trees, due to um, cornfields being planted near the near the forest in certain areas. So really it gives us an idea of where we can predict the areas of conflict and it provides us a tool to advise local farmers on the positioning of, farm, on, of farms, pastures, livestock and crop fields. So it's a really important tool and it's really good to work with the locals in order to um, you know, get a, a better layout of, of human land use. Um, compensation programs, it, it could be a... Um, a dubious one where a lot of people don't believe they work. I, I do believe they work. We've got first-hand experience that they do work. Obviously, we don't believe it's a, a long-term solution, but it, it certainly gives people a, a tangible return for bear inflicted damages. And the people are really happy with the, the good breeds of, of livestock that we provide that, you know, it won't um, compensate the whole loss that they've got, but it definitely will um, enable them and it will um, foster a relationship between them and us, and it will help us in the future to um, collaborate and cooperate with, with communities. Uh, we do believe it maintains a healthy bond with projects and community. It does need uh, expert field coordination to go and check on what damages have been done and also to the extent of damages. But um, we, with our um, experience, believe that it's a, a viable, at least short term solution to the problem. So we'll talk about deterrence just really quickly. Um, the deterrence with Andean bears, we, we, we haven't had much success with them. The bears have generally got the intelligence that they learn um, to avoid them, to evade them. So, um, you know, some people use recordings of dogs barking, electric fences, barbed wire fences. Um, also with the, the layout of the land here, it's really impractical to use fences because there's so many small farmsteads really close to the mountains that to provide every single landowner with 
um, the fencing equipment is is very difficult and almost impractical in ways. I don't have any pictures of that because I've been working on this in the mountains. So just two pictures of, of the dogs here that we have. And uh, yeah, next. Um, community support, I believe, is a really, really important tool where we work together with communities, uh, providing them support, um, especially in areas surrounding bear habitat, wild species habitat in general, um, which really helps reduce conflict. For example, I set up a school truck project, uh, which is now a school bus, I guess. Um, it's evolved over the years, and this has been going on for 17 years now, and um, it's provided the, the kids uh, a way of getting to school. They were never able to go to school, so the boys were going to work in the fields at a very young age, backbreaking work. The girls were basically um, leaving school to work in the kitchen with their mothers, and it was they were they were having kids early. It was basically a vicious cycle of poverty. So to enable them to get a secondary education has really helped them. It's something they never had the opportunity for in the past, and um, that has really, with the um, contrapart, um, I'm thinking in Spanish, with the um, agreement that they um, don't go and hunt the bears or don't go and kill the bears for any damages that are done, they come to us. It's really, really had a massive impact on, on the bear populations in the local area and a positive impact on the locals too. Um, another, um, I guess, community project, but it's also a non-destructive of alternative source of income um, is tourism. Community tourism projects really do provide sustainable, non-destructive alternatives to the slash and burn farming. Um, I found funds and we've been setting up a community tourism program. And as you can see, we've built a community tourism lodge or it's, it's well, it's further on than that. Again, I didn't have the photographs. And um, it's a real way of, you know, uh, not just them appreciating what they've got, but it, it, once they're teaching other people about the beauty of their, of their area uh, in these projects, then they start to appreciate it a bit more themselves. So it, it's really, a so as I was saying, it's a real way of um, them gaining an income from doing something that's non-destructive and also it's a way of them gaining an even more enhanced appreciation of, of the place they're from, of the place they live into, which is a great thing. Another non-destructive sustainable source of income is through uh, different ways of agriculture, alter alternatives in agriculture as well that have a minimal impact on the environment. Uh, for example, um, crops and products that use less space, they have they avoid the need for wide-scale destruction, use less pesticides, provide greater income, and can be set up as a community initiative to get the people involved on a, on a community level. Um, a couple of the projects, one project that I would like to set up here in the Amazon, uh, we're just getting into this, is to uh, plant vanilla, potentially in greenhouses or under the shade of forest. So obviously under the shade of forest, it, it promotes the protection of the forest rather than the chopping down of it. And with a greenhouse, it's a small scale intensive project that isn't using chemicals that will really help the people too. Um, there's a number of different uh, fruits in the Amazon. There's pitahaya down here, uh, pepinillo over here. And they're also things that can be grown on a small scale space wise and can provide good income so that the people aren't chopping hectares and hectares of forest down for their livestock, uh, which certainly can be another alternative and these alternatives are so important to enable the people to um you know to continue to survive but at the same time they're not having a negative impact or having a less negative impact on the environment itself i have a feeling my camera's gone so i'm gonna do a bit more or do something so many apologies i think you lost my camera there i think you can live without me for a little bit um okay another um, conflict issue is roads and highways bisecting habitat. You can see in the top right here, um, there's um, the interoceanic highway that goes from the Andes to the um, to the Amazon in the Sucumbias province. And you can see that this highway, and this is only the few bears that we've had um, collared in this area, is bisecting four different um, bear home ranges, which is obviously a major problem where the bears have to cross this massive uh, four lane busy highway to get from one area of where they eat and, and the, the breeding sites and the maternal de denning sites to the, to the other. So it's really a difficult situation. Um, down in the bottom left here is a bear that was unfortunately found in the middle of the road. I think she, the mother was startled by a car and the, the cub fell off her back. They generally um, carry them on their backs. And because the person picked it up, the mother was probably by the side of the road and um she she was looking for it but unfortunately somebody had taken it to be rescued so we tried to uh, reunite the cub with mother the following day but unfortunately she'd gone um 
And the same thing here with the mountain tapir uh, that we're putting a collar on so we can study it. Um, was a mountain tapir that was um, at the side of the road that had had um, some injuries, so uh, we had to, um, you know, make sure it was of good health, and then we released it at this further away from the road. But unfortunately, we're always going to have those problems. Um, so at the sorry at the Andean Bear Foundation, um, the ways we mitigate these problems are by um, we've got a road, sign road signage system, especially throughout areas where there are um, known bear crossings, corridors that the bears use between um, patches, between core areas. Um, we've put speed reducers on certain highways to stop the cars from going as fast. Um, awareness programs with the people, um, you know, so that they're aware that the, the bears are endangered, they need protecting. Um, something that we haven't done, but is a possibility in the future, perhaps ecological bridges. You can see one down at the bottom here. and corridor tunnels below the highways which do happen in other countries we haven't got the funds for that we haven't got funds for much to be honest but hopefully in the future we can start to do things like this as well which is certainly a, a very recommended tool okay so um another thing that we do here is habitat restoration and reconnection so i mentioned the corridors down at the bottom left here we can see some identified corridors in the intag region of the andes and uh, we have identified these corridors and started to re forest them and basically that will reconnect the, the forest patches and allow the bears and other animals to safely pass between between their core areas which is really really vital um, so um, you can see some videos some pictures here of um, reforestation programs with the locals um, you know local community projects where the locals are planting trees with the schools with um, international volunteers that visit us occasionally and uh, this is a really really important tool to be able to help um, prevent these problems that are caused by highways that are caused by the deforestation of the wildlife corridors too um, so environmental education is another key issue where um, it's really important to the project success working with local schools um, focusing on the younger generation which are generally the ones that are going to soak up that information more than the adults not to say that the adults wouldn't learn as well but of course they're more set in their ways I guess and make it interactive make it fun take them on field trips um, and foster a love and respect for nature it's something that we do you know you can see with the um, the bear so yeah you can see the kids have a lot of fun with the the bear costume and you know all the all the great things that we try and do with them whether it be in the field whether it be in the classroom and uh, it's a real fun event and it really does foster that love and respect for nature within the kids i mean we don't just do it with the bears but it's a focal issue it's i guess a flag flagship species and um you know obviously we do talk about and and teach about other uh, species and the importance of protecting the environment as a whole too um, so we really believe something that we've always done and I've mentioned this a lot in the presentation is local community involvement is crucial to the success of any project. I think a lot of projects fail because they don't have the locals involved with them and it's something that is really important. Um, involve them in the research activities, create an interest in our work, collaborate with community events like community work days, they call them Mingas here. We can train marketable conservation skills, for example, with the locals that we've um, trained up to be field assistants trying to use local people as much as possible and um, also obviously to respect and know the culture and really you know try and become part of the community not just somebody who's coming to the area and studying a species or trying to protect the environment and not really getting involved which is i think where a lot of projects fail before they've even started so that's such an important thing that i really really emphasize to anybody who wants to set up a project that please um, get the community involved um, okay, in summary, um, so basically conservation efforts are a priority in human landscapes as wildlife are at more higher risk. Uh, research is a key to understanding and dealing with conservation issues at hand. Research is so important and we need to continue to promote that harmony between humans and nature. I do believe we can get that back and, and we can only get that back by, by educating, by teaching, by making people. Yeah, it's, it's so important to promote the harmony between humans and nature. I really do. We can recreate that. We can get that back as to what it was. Maybe not to the same level, but you know, people are getting more interested in the environment and we can do a lot by educating, by making people more aware. We can provide non-destructive sustainable sources of income as, as a possibility to prevent the slash and burn farming techniques and, and you know, give people a good living without affecting the environment negatively. Many people don't want to um, negatively impact the environment but sometimes they've got no choice so if we give them another choice I'm sure they'll be very interested in that one and also of course educate and involve locals in any conservation initiative as I've just said which is so crucial to the success in 
in protecting and conserving wildlife in human landscapes. Okay, so finally, I'd like to thank you all. Sorry about the technical issues. I, um, thank everybody that's present at the conference. I really appreciate you listening, and I hope you've I've been able to help in some small way uh, to any project that you may be setting up. Thanks to Alcohol Wildlife for the invitation. Uh, thanks to Fernando, um, and of course, Conservation Careers. That's the only reason I was presenting here today. Um, obviously, the Andean Bear Foundation's there. They're the foundation I work with, Fundacion. Apologies for the technical issues, um, but I just wanted to wish everybody the best of luck with their wildlife conservation endeavors wherever you are and everybody have a, the best of times and the best of luck with everything. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Okay. Thank you, David, for your presentation. It was so interesting, I think. A lot of work. I'm so impressed. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work. I mean, I, I was watching it myself and, you know, there's things that I probably could have presented in a better way, but hopefully uh, people got the gist of things. And, you know, if anybody's got any questions, um, please feel free to ask me um, anything that wasn't quite clear or anything that you're interested in finding out as well. Sure. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna okay. So we are so setting this up so you can see the audience. Okay. Great. <laughs> you could see them all. Maybe there's a familiar face there. There are people here. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Coming? No. Sí. Okay. Mm. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. So do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, hello, Willy. Uh, can you can you tell us some, if you have some figures how this has changed the acceptance of the local people to the bear over the years into your work? I mean, do you, do you have any idea if, if they are more open to tolerate the species there, or how is it? I couldn't hear that particularly well. Is there any way that um, somebody nearer to the camera, maybe Fernando, uh, could? could just to give me the question, I'm sorry about that. We can, we can repeat the question. Um, basically, it's it, do you have any data figures or a, even a feeling of how the perception of the people has changed, like the acceptance of the fauna uh, of the bears in, in this time? And maybe it, it is different for some locations where you have done different things. For sure. Um, yeah, that's thanks for the question. Uh, that's a really good question. We have done um, surveys on on people's in, people's opinions, people's um, beliefs towards the bears. You know, throughout different time frames, uh, maybe um, two, three years apart, to see how opinions are changing. Um, of course, with the environmental education programs that we do, um, we've noticed a difference in people's people's opinions, uh, people's interest in trying to protect the environment, people. Um, that are more conscious of their impact on the world and also um, of the importance of protecting the natural environment as far as, um, you know, maintaining the water, the, the hydrological cycle, maintaining the water levels, maintaining a healthy environment, which is something that everybody relies on. So um, we have noticed a difference in people's opinions over the year. I've got surveys um, that obviously I didn't put on the presentation, but we do do that. And uh, it's something that I find really important to get people's opinion especially in areas that are surrounding bear or any other of course any other species habitat okay so i have a question um you didn't mention uh, where bears already before in that area or it was like uh, uh, Reintroduction and and how many years was the uh, to get where when bears were not there because it can of course have an impact on uh, on the conflict because for example if there is a long gap the people uh, are already not used to that animal and they don't know for example how to care about uh, uh, cattle in the way that it's safe from the bears? Okay, um, so I think the question was, 
um, if the if the bears were already present in the area where we've released them back into the wild and I missed a little bit in the middle what was the rest um, there was something about could you maybe just continue that sorry Fernando it's just a little bit difficult with the distance from the microphone to or maybe uh, just without the lips I apologize um, yeah just to okay. get, make sure I answer the question correctly uh, if bears were in the area uh, before the project, before the reintroduction of them, and how long was the gap between they were there and the new, new introduction? Because it can have, of course, co consequence to how to solve the conflict, because uh, if people are used to bears, I, I mean, for example, how they uh, have cattle in the landscape. If there, if there were, if they were, if there is a knowledge how to protect uh, the yep. uh, yeah, the cattle against bears. Okay, um, thanks for the question. Uh, that's great. And um, so, I guess one thing that I'd, I'd clarify there is that I, I did use the word reintrodu reintroduction, reintroduce. It's a, it's a word that I, I guess we use here, and it's kind of accepted as a word, um, whether there is a uh, an existing population or not. I know that I think the correct definition of the term is for reintroduction is somewhere where the bears were and then they've been, they've, they've disappeared and then they've been released back where they weren't before. So in our case, we've, we've released bears always in areas where the bears have already been present and it's to um, boost the populations because we've seen a massive population decline, although the bears do still exist in the places where we've released them back into the wild. Um, so the, the the people have always been aware, well, they've been aware that the bears are present, the bears are quite elusive, so a lot of people, even in the areas around surrounding bear habitat, don't even realize they've got bears in the mountains sometimes, but um, bear, Andean bears are opportunistic and generalistic feeders, so they generally um, will eat pretty much what they come across, and it hasn't been a major problem in the past, it's only over the last maybe two centuries that Indian bears have started to to predate, depredate cattle. Um, we've seen um, an actual behavior of Andean bears being generalistic, opportunistic feeders. They have um, hunted and, and killed mountain tapirs, uh, another species that we work with. So that's something that um, there's um, records of going back to when the Spaniards first came to South America, maybe 500 years ago or something like that. So they certainly do have the predatory behavior. Obviously, they are carnivores. Um, strictly speaking, as far as uh, the taxonomy is concerned. And um, despite being carnivores from the order carnivora taxonomically, uh, Andean bears generally have um, kind of, they've um, sort of gone away from hunting and they, I would say they're probably about 90% vegetarian. They, they generally eat um, lots of uh, bromeliads, lots of wild fruits, um, types of bamboo, types of palms. So, it's it's not it is it is part of the diet. They'll eat small rodents, they'll eat um, small mammals, um, they'll eat insects, and they'll start digging in the ground. And then they do have this behavior where they occasionally have um, hunted mountain tapirs in the past. And the the problem with cattle um, probably started in the 1990s, 2000s, and, and um, it's probably something that has been a cause from um, this problem that we're talking about in the conference, which is um, wildlife conservation and human landscapes. Obviously the the human landscape, the, the agricultural boundary um, was getting closer and closer to natural environment. It was taking away the natural foodstuffs of the bears, obviously from deforestation. And um, instead of the um, forest being there, the cattle was placed there and then people, then the bears have started coming down and eating, eating the livestock. It's generally only one or two problem bears in, in a certain region. It seems like they've almost, they've certainly got a social hierarchy within the population and there's one, one bear that will cause the problems, it will be the one that hunts the, the cattle. It's generally a large male, but not, not specifically. And, um, you know, for example, people could say that the solution would be maybe to um, relocate the, the problem bear. This is something that uh, we've discussed and we believe that relocating a problem bear is still, the problem's not gonna disappear because there, there will always be another male or another bear that will take his place as the, maybe the, the dominant one in the in the region and um, they will be the ones that predate cattle from there because obviously once a bear a problem bear as we call it um, does depredate a cattle a live head of cattle um, it will eat what it can and then the other bears will come in and uh, kind of feed on the rest as well so they will get that taste for me it's almost like 
they will um, almost they will taste meat and then they will they want to go back for more if you like. It's something that they realize is a really good nutritional food source and then they will go back. Uh, because they've kind of lost that predatory instinct as well, something that's interesting, as you saw probably with some of the photographs, Andean bears don't go for a quick kill like um, other predators generally do, like go for the jugular of the bane and, and kill the animal or, or jaguars where they almost crush the skull when they when they predate. Um, the Andean bears will jump on the, the, the livestock or the cow's back and start ripping chunks out, which it's really horrible. You can see those photographs. It must be a horrible experience, of course, for, for any um, livestock, whether it be a cow or a horse or anything like that. And um, it's a very slow and painful death if the, if the actual animal does die, but sometimes they do survive from it. But um, it's something that, you know, is another indication that they have lost that predator instinct, but they've, they've gone back to it again and they're starting to um, predate, but they're not going for it in, in the way that perhaps um, other bears or other predatory animals would. Um, so I, I know I'm going off on tangents there just to explain a few things, but um, to answer your question, it's actually a reinsertion, I guess, to say that we've done. It's not, a, a, strictly speaking, a reintroduction. And um, yeah, the people have been aware of the bears in the region, but it's not been a problem with the cattle until over the last couple of decades. Um, is there anything that you want to add, add to that, those questions, just uh, to clarify anything that I may have said? Um, sorry, I didn't get the name of the person who asked the question. Well, if there is any other question here in the yeah. 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 Like, like brown worms, for example. Yeah. Yeah. The, the if if there is any risk, uh, direct risk for humans, are humans uh, directly scared of the birds, and are there known attacks at any point? And also if there is a problem with garbage sites, like places where people... Right, okay, that's a good question. Uh, with As far as um, human safety, um, it, it's very rare. Andean bears try and avoid human contact at all costs. Um, they're, as I said, they're very elusive. They're very shy species where they, they try and they don't really want to come down to, close to, um, to human settlements. Uh, so there's not really a problem, not really a risk of anybody being attacked. The only situations in which I would suggest that there may be a possibility of somebody getting attacked is if they um, if they get between mother and cub, that could cause an uh, cause an accident. It, it could cause uh, an attack. Um, there's not been any anybody that's been killed by an Andean bear, and as far as I'm I'm aware, um, you know, in the history of the whole continent from northern Argentina up to up to Colombia and up to western Venezuela, I don't think there's any. It, any um, incident where an Andean bear has actually killed a, a human being. Uh, I know that farmers have tried to shoot the bears and once the farmers do start shooting the bears, the bears will occasionally chase them. Um, but there's not been any, any serious injuries that have been provoked or caused by that. And the other part of that question, sorry, there's just somebody at the door. I'm just gonna tell them there's nobody here. Sorry about that. And sorry, the, the other part of the question was, um, can you just remind me that? Um, the garbage sites or, or dumping? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know that's a big problem with other bear species. Um, you probably could see, a, a, there was a, one of the photographs there with a bear in a garbage um, bin or, or a trash can. Um, that was actually a reintroduced bear that was, you know, released too close to, um, it was, that was a hacienda. It was a, a one building in the middle of 26,000 hectares of land. And the bear actually um, made its way back there and started causing problems in the hacienda. It actually went inside inside the the place and sat down. Well, we, it kind of went in there and took the food and the kitchen, and and it was taking um, the trash, as you say. But um, with wild bears, I've not had any problems with with bears looking through trash cans like they like they do in parts of Europe and the in the USA and Canada. So uh, that's something that may come in the future with uh, more conflict situations. But up until now. There's not been any problems with uh, with garbage. We have a question from the chat, David. Uh, but I think we are going to paraphrase it. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so what um, what action when when a poacher is is caught <laughs> with bloody hands? Uh, yeah. What are the consequences? Uh, what does well, it lead to that case? 
that's a great question too. Um, there is, there are um, laws in place, uh, laws of um, somebody going to jail for three years if they hunt a, a bear. Being a, it's the Andean bear is vulnerable throughout its range, but it's actually endangered in in the country of Ecuador. Um, so the the law here is that somebody would go to jail for three years if they are caught hunting a bear. Unfortunately, the the laws here. Um, as you can imagine, with the Latin American, the South American country, there's a lot of corruption and uh, laws aren't generally enforced. And, and as, as much as you try and get them enforced, it's very um, difficult for them to to be implemented, if you know what I mean. Um, there are situations, for example, where I've known of somebody that's hunted a car, hunted a bear for uh, eating its corn. Uh, it's a really difficult situation as a as a researcher in an area where there are human settlements that, you know, you've kind of got to understand both sides of the coin. Obviously the bears, well, the bears, the Andean bears have been in the, in this area for over 2 million years now. And um, the human populations, the actual populations in the study areas that I've got have only been around for about 150 years. So um, it's something that we do talk about when we've got the awareness programs and the edu education programs that we give, but it's not actually the Andean bears that are invading on the human domain, as, as I mentioned we're actually invading on their terrain. And uh, it's difficult to tell them that, but it's something that you know we try and do say, but you have to understand their side of the story because you need the local people to, to be on your side, to really be, um, to try and get them to start to conserve Andean bears. So that's why we talk about compensation, talk about um, the alternative sources of income. And there are people, local farmers that I've known have killed bears, but it's not something I would go and, uh, I would uh, go and tell the police, or oh, look, this person's done this or done that, because that will just cause a huge problem as far as, um, you know, generally, if you do, if you do target somebody for doing that, because, you know, the, it's a retaliation for something that a, 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 a head of cattle will um, clothe and feed and, and allow them to um, educate their family. So it's a really difficult situation where you do have to understand them too. And, um, yeah, it's something that is delicate and we try and keep out of uh, this situation where we're enforcing the law at this moment in time because the people here are living in serious poverty in the mountain regions and um, I would suggest in those situations, I know it's something that we don't like to happen, but the, the solution to the problem is not to uh, get them to go to jail for three years, it's to try and almost rehabilitate them, if you like, and uh, try and teach them the importance of protecting nature, the importance of protecting endangered species right i can imagine <laughs> right okay. any last question mm, oh. then then i take advantage and ask you a last one okay of if, course. You, <laughs> if you could ask for anything or you had unlimited funding maybe not unlimited funding but if you could ask for funding for a measure that you could in, uh, implement which one will it be? What would you like to do if you had access to funding? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, uh, maybe a short term one uh, would be to continue the maternal behavior study. I did briefly mention the maternal denning sites, which is something that's so important to the life history uh, and the longevity of the species. Um, I think it's something that's really important and something that's not um, been studied at all until we've recently started uh, studying the behavior. We, we've got the first um, video recordings and um, behavioral studies of Andean bear mothers and how they interact with the cubs in the nest um, for the first three months. And it's something that I think is a real gap in the knowledge of the Andean bear that we'd really like to fill in. And I think once we've got that, we can definitely do a lot more to protect them because um, obviously with the government, it's difficult to lobby for legislation change. It's difficult to lobby for the the um, increase in size of protected areas, but um, these areas are so important, uh, especially because they only have one or two cubs and uh, they only have a cub every two years perhaps. And uh, for the longevity of the species, it's so important to protect those sites because if they don't have those sites, as I said, they are very selective over them um, due to the, um, they, they needs to be sheltered because the, their, their habitat, even though we're on the equator is at 4,000 meters in altitude occasionally, which is really cold. Um, they need to be able to protect the cubs because the cubs are born at about 300 grams in size. They're tiny and they need to be protected from the cold and the wind. Um, so those sites are very, very um, limited and they're, very, they're getting closer and closer to human settlements. So I would really like to start 
working on um, finding out more about that and then being able to provide more information to governments to make sure those areas are protected. Um, I think that would be the main thing that came to the top of my head. There's many things as well, but... Uh, uh, so let's hope it. for it. If anyone listening now or in the future in these videos <laughs> yeah. is interested, then please get in contact with David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, All right. So, so thank you very much, David, for for your talk and for your time. <laughs> for your work. <laughs> <laughs>